<clears throat> Hello, um, Mark. Um, Hello everyone. Mark 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 Buka. Hello Martin. Good afternoon to you just joined, you just joined. Hi, Professor. Good afternoon. Uh, when can we hear back about the grade? Sorry? When can we hear like about the score, the midterm? Ah, uh, probably this week. You expect a lot? <laughs> Actually, I finished with uh, the, the, yeah, um, grading all the exam. So I just need to send the email to you guys. Well, so your feedback, you guys feedback on the exam was uh, mostly quite difficult or difficult, right? Um, so actually I didn't know. So your 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 level of understanding uh, on this uh, subject. So, where well, some of the questions, I thought maybe a little bit challenging. So I thought uh, I thought uh, thought uh, a lot about. Uh, uh, thought sometimes I think whether this question is um, suitable or not, but I, I didn't know I much really aware about your, uh, your uh, level, understand, level of understanding. So, but uh, from this exam, I get to know a little bit more about your guys' understanding of this uh, principle. So in the final, Maybe uh, the questions may be a little bit easier, maybe, maybe less difficult. So I think that would be more precise statement, <clears throat> less difficult. Um, the average score, I don't know, maybe around five, or less than five, maybe, yeah. The highest score is nine. Uh, average maybe five or around five, yeah. Can you just tell us the score today, no? Today, it takes time because it's, it, so the number of students I teach right now, it, the size of this class is, is almost more than six, around 66, right? Or 64, five. I mean, so I need to send email individually today. So, but I, I, I'm gonna review the midterm exam today uh, in this lecture. So, so I'm, I'm gonna send the email as, as possible, uh, probably by, at the latest by tomorrow, okay? So you wanna receive the, your result uh, at the latest by tomorrow. 
Okay, so uh, today, uh, so we are going to review this real-time video. So if you guys have any objection, then please let me please uh, let me know. Okay, so then uh, you can think about it. Professor, for example, if tomorrow we receive the midterm uh, exam, are we gonna know our ranking? Um, I'm gonna let you know, guys, the average score. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I think you many, many of you guys have, have a keen interest in uh, where you are ranked. So I'm gonna give you some kind of a love idea of, of where you may be uh, in this whole class. So I'm gonna give you some, um, some information, not just about average, but just about kind of the distribution of the scores, okay? Like uh, we, uh, we get like we are uh, like this standard normal distribution or something like this, right? Okay, so I'm gonna give you some kind of a uh, hint that professor, will yeah. you tell us our score? Sorry, will you tell us our score? I'm gonna send you email uh, at the later part tomorrow individually. Okay, your uh, okay, yeah. But before that, I want to make sure that you guys agree on the uh, on the answers to each question. Okay, so if you guys have any objection, then yeah, please let me know. Uh, what's this? Okay. Okay, question one. Um, okay, so you first read this article and then considering the article in the previous slide, which of the following statements are most likely to be incorrect? Most likely to be incorrect. So you need to choose the one that is most likely to be incorrect, right? So A, B, and D, I think it, they are, Compared to C, they are correct, right? But C, a lot of goods may help to improve networking capital and the cash flow, where a lot of goods means that they purchase a lot of inventory, right? But if you, and if you read the article, uh, the strategy is not pretty going well, right? So then uh, networking capital, if you have uh, too much, the good is, is going to be inventory, right? So if you have too much inventory, then you're going to have uh, too much uh, current asset. And uh, too much current asset means, um, yeah, less cash flow, right? Cash flow is going to be getting worse. So I think the answer is C. Any objection? No. Okay. Well, uh, many of you guys uh, get these questions right. Question right. Okay. So, <laughs> well, um, this one seems 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 to be quite challenging for many of you guys. Um, so let's calculate um, operating cash flow. Operating cash flow. Okay. Operating. First of all, the 100 uh, of the series is cash, operating cash, in your calculate operating cash, we should uh, include this uh, cash inflow as it include this as cash inflow. And the cost should be deducted from sales, right? And the other expenses uh, where we assume that this other expenses related to operating, so we should deduct the other expenses. And to calculate uh, uh, the taxes, you, we should also, uh, depreciation expense also related uh, the operating, right? So we should deduct this uh, depreciation expense. And to calculate the taxes, this interest expense should be also deducted, right? Because this is a tax deductible. So then if you 
100, minus 70, minus 5, minus 3, and minus 2. Then we are going to have uh, uh, how much? 20, right? 20. So then tax rate is 10%. Then tax is going to be 10%. So the tax is going to 2, right? So tax is 2. So um, at the dividends, and um, a new issuance of equity, it doesn't matter. I mean, we are talking about operating cash flow, right? Dividends and the new uh, equity and the interest you know, is not related to the operating cash flow, right? So you don't concern uh, with this uh, 20 uh, new issuance of equity and the dividend and interest. So, um, but we should concern this uh, sales cost, other uh, expenses, and the taxes. But, but when it comes to cash, this depreciation expense should be added back, right? So uh, up to now, uh, up before tax, uh, the um, before tax, the earnings are twenty. After the tax, then earnings are after tax. 20 and after tax, 18, right? Then 18 plus, we should add back depreciation expenses, right? And this 18 included uh, interest expenses, right? So interest expenses is not related to operating cash flow. So this expense should be also added back. So then, the operating cash flow is 23. So answer is 23. Any objection or any, any questions? You guys understand? Many of you guys get this cash flow wrong. Uh, any questions? Interest expenses is not related to operating, but when you calculate the taxes, you should deduct interest expenses from the operating, uh, from the earnings, from, from sales, right? And then this tax is also part of the operating, so a tax should be deducted. So we deduct tax and uh, we added back the depreciation expenses and the interest expenses to this uh, 18, because 18 include the depreciation expenses and the interest expenses, okay? Depreciation expenses is a non-cash flow uh, item, and interest expense is not, this is a cash flow, but not related to operating. That's why we added it back. So we have a 23. Well, uh, this one is a little bit challenging, but okay. Uh, number three, um, this is the estimated monthly installments to drive Mercedes GT with the conditions as shown on the left. Recently, the finance, financing conditions have changed to 6.2% 6, 6 from 911 uh, 5 point and 11, 19 percent for the estimated APR. So interest rate has increased, right? So as a result of monthly payment would be would what? Well, um, we should pay out this uh, fixed amount of 90, around 91,000 to purchase this uh, for this Mercedes, right? So this is the uh, present value, right? This should be the present value. It, this does not change, right? And the instrument, right? Instrument, instrument, instrument year one, instrument year one, instrument year two, right? Over, over many periods. Right. 
we don't know the the uh, the number of uh, the the period, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the the key is that when the discount rate, right? When the discount rate, this R increases from previous one, then what would happen to this instrument payment? That's the question, right? Once the instrument payment, because this fixed, uh, the present value is, is a fixture. We shouldn't meet this uh, present value by paying this instrument payment, instrument payment over the long period of time, right? But when the interest rate interest rate has increased, then uh, the present value of each instrument is, is instrument pay instrument will be reduced if we do not increase the instrument payment, right? To meet this uh, present value, so that's why uh, monthly payment should increase due to lower present value of monthly payments, right? If we keep paying the same instrument like this, right? So then this instrument uh, only uh, the, the, uh, meet the, um, the total amount of finance when we have this interest rate. But if the interest rate is getting higher, increased from increased to 6.2, this uh, estimated payment should increase to meet this total amount of financed, right, logically. So that's why answer is C. So many of you guys, I think, get these questions right. Any objection? Okay. Number four. So if you read this uh, terms, this is kind of a restriction, right? Kind of uh, what you have to. Uh, this is from uh, this is the kind of uh, conditions uh, uh, that the credit requires of the uh, the, the debtor, right? So so long as the bonds are outstanding, the bond holders, the outstanding bond issuers should not, right? They should not blah 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 blah. So. It, in the the contracts of the bond, the bond contract, the, the agreement between bond holder and the bond issuer, the contract is called indenture. But it, within the indenture, these conditions, right, some kind of restrictive conditions, is called the covenant. Okay, not credit rating, not corruption, covenant. So within the indenture. If you go to covenant, you can find this kind of uh, yeah, restrictions. So if you uh, had a chance to read, uh, understand the terms of the bond, bond agreement, then you may have chosen uh, this yeah, covenant as an answer. Okay, number five. Are you guys okay? No objection? <laughs> okay. Please check the box of the right answer. Okay, A is bond price is inversely related to market discounts. When the market discount increases, the bond price decreases. True, right? Mm -hmm. the, for the same coupon rate, time to maturity, percentage price change is greater. When the market discount rate goes up, then goes down. Birds, right? For the same time to maturity, lower coupon balance has a greater percentage change than higher coupon. True, right? And the generally for the same coupon rate, shorter term has a greater price change, price change than long term balance. Birds, right? Okay, this question <laughs> actually uh, related to number six, right? So if you guys uh, get this question right, if you <laughs> you guys are supposed to uh, get all this question number six uh, right, but <laughs> the funny thing is that 
some of you guys get this question right, number five right. But ironically, the same students get the six, uh, sometimes only one they get right, and sometimes both of them get wrong, they get wrong. So it was a little bit uh, ironic, yeah. So if you have a good understanding uh, on the characteristics of bond, then you are supposed to uh, choose uh, uh, B and C, right? No further explanation needed for question six, right? Hmm. Pretty self-explanatory self, uh, self, uh, if you uh, have this question right. Okay, number seven. Um, number seven, number seven may be a, a little bit challenging, uh, but many of you guys get this question right. Um, from selling in short-term treasuries, uh, selling short-term uh, in treasuries indicated that investors once again lifting the expectations for high interest rates could write could rates could write this again and could write this year. So current year the of short term treasury are likely to increase. True or false? Well why is it true? Why is it true? Hmm? Why is it true? Martin, did you get did you choose a seven A true as answer, Martin Jerome? The A one. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it true? Why this is true? Um. Because I, I mean, it seems like logic to me, but I couldn't explain why. Yeah. So the current year of short term interest. The short term treasuries. The current yield is basically current yield is a coupon, right? Annual coupon amount divided by the, the current price of the bond, right? This is a current yield. So if you, so when, the, when they sell short term treasury, right? So then the, the price of short-term trading will go down, right? If, if you sell the bond, then the price of the bond will keep, will keep yeah, decreasing, right? So if coupon prices goes down, as the current, the, the, the price of the short-term trading goes down, The this coupon the this coupon amount is fixed, it does not change, right? So it does not change. So that's why when the denominator is getting lower, then the current yield is, is supposed to increase, right? Logically, right? So that's why it is true. Understand? <laughs> you guys understand? Martin, does this make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. And here the couple of short term treasury are moving upward. So if the prices goes down, it means that yield of the short term treasury supposed to goes up, right? Increases, should increase because it has an inverse relationship. There's an inverse relationship between price and yield, right? So it is true. Any objection? No? Okay. From treasury, here is a set of floor on borrowing costs across the economy and uh, important input financial models that investors use to value stock and other assets. Okay, so here is also it is uh, important in the valuation of the stocks and uh, the assets, right? So then higher treasury yields help increase the value of stock. 
if yields increases, in other words, if interest rates increases, then you think you expect value of stock to increase as well? I don't think so, right? Basically, it, it, the increases in the interest rate means that um, the borrowing cost will be higher and the investment will shrink for a high interest rate and the demand will also, uh, yeah. Demand, the demand for goods and services will also yeah, uh, diminish. So I don't think the uh, higher interest treasury is a higher interest will help uh, the value of the stock, okay? How about different discount this model? Different discount, oh, there was a, uh, yeah, typo, sorry. Different discount model, <laughs> okay? It is this different discount model. Uh, different discount model is not affected by years. Is it true or false? Uh, Yana, is this true or false? False, because when we calculate uh, dividends model, there is um, in, one second, uh, in denominator we have the required return, which is yield to maturity in this case. Right. Right. If you, uh, if you, I mean, this, this is pretty, um, yeah, this is pretty, I think you, when you guys work on uh, this corporate finance, the middle term, I think this formula may come pretty familiar, right? So to you guys, so I think uh, if you re record this formula, then you should suppose choose first. first. Uh, thank you, Yana, yeah. Any objections? Well, I'm just asking because I'm not sure, but isn't, doesn't the dividend discount model assume that required rate of return is constant? I remember there are four assumptions of the model. Uh, yeah. Um, right, dividend discount model is not backed by ears. Um, right, when, oh, it so comes, if when it comes I, to, yeah, sorry, two seconds. No, no. Yes. So, I, I, the, the question is not uh, whether uh, the uh, the value of uh, uh, stock will increase or decrease. The, the, basically, the statement is pretty simple. The dividend discount model is not affected by the years. That's all. Uh, yeah, for sure, the growth rate should also affect the value of uh, 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 value of the stock based on the dividend discount model. Sure, yeah. For sure, uh, but that's true. Yeah, the growth, the growth rate should also, uh, yeah, have a, so another factor to consider in the valuation of stock. But uh, if you just uh, simply, if you have just simple mind, if you just read this statement, the different discount is not affected by the years. Well, it's not easy to say that. Oh, it's true. It's not easy to accept that it is true, right? more close to first because uh, as the interest rate the, in, it is higher than the value of the stock supposed to go down because it is a, a positive demand denominator, right? In the valuation of uh, stock. Do you, uh, this, this, explanation, this explanation is okay? For the, any further objection to, uh, sorry, I, I don't know how to uh, pronounce your name. It's pretty. It's, uh, it's okay. I was just saying that I remember that DDM has four assumptions. 
And one of the assumption is that the required rate of return, not the growth rate, the, the required rate of return R is constant. But I'm not sure if I may remember correctly. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So required rate of return is supposed to be constant, but the rate, once you have one specific uh, interest rate, right? Okay, so you are going to, you have, you have some specific time today. Okay, today you are going to value uh, the stock using the, um, the current, the, the, the uh, 10 year treasury yield rate, right? Today, based on, uh, as of today, right? But let's say tomorrow, right? Today and tomorrow, tomorrow. If you value the same stock tomorrow, let's say the Federal Reserve has increased their federal rate yesterday, right? So then the 10 year year must have increased, right? So then your valuation of the stock would change the downward, right? So uh, when 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 I when uh, the cost when we say the the uh, discount rate this R is constant means that in the calculation of the uh, in the valuation of the stock at some specific point you should apply the same discount rate, but the discount rate itself changes every day. Okay, so within the context of uh, the calculation of the valuation, the calculation of the, the valuation of the stock, the interest rate you should apply should be constant. That's true, but the rate itself changes every day. So if you if the if the rate increases tomorrow then the value of the stock will decrease. But um, yeah, I think the language is a little bit confusing, could be confusing because the dividend discount model is not affected by the years. So, uh, I think it, there's still a little bit room for um, this, um, this, uh, this, uh, the different interpretations. I, I understand. Yeah, you could uh, you could may say, where, um, but my intention was that if you, because a different discount but it is used to value stock, right? So <laughs> I thought when you if I extended this state, if I extended this question, when you use the discount model, as you can see, first of all, you should you should have in mind this statement: Treasury is a set of a set of flow of borrowing costs, and then there are important input in financial models that investors use to value stock and other assets. So. First of all, you should have this statement in your mind. And then you should look at this question. If you are, if, if I, if you don't have this statement and I, and, and, and I simply give you, if, if I, I gave you this statement alone, then where, well, yeah, there's a room for kind of a different interpretation like as you, like you, like as you, uh, as you do, as you do. But I clearly <laughs> think that when you, uh, you, when you read this statement, I think uh, it even discount what it should be linked to, to the valuation of the stock. And then the valuation of the stock uh, would be uh, affected uh, by the years uh, when, when you, you when, uh, when you use uh, the different discount model as a tool. Um, what do you think? 
I think that if <laughs> theoretically, if the assumption is like that, saying that required return is constant, it shouldn't be affected by the yield. Because I, I read the statement that you gave to, but I was thinking if that is the theoretical assumptions, then that should be true because the required rate of return is constant. It shouldn't be affected by anything. That's what I understand. But if your explanation is like that, I think it makes sense too. Um, yeah, the interest rate in the discount model is supposed to be constant. But when the, 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 the constant uh, in the assumptions means that you should apply the same interest rate, same interest, same discount rate in each period. That's what that's what the assumption says. Okay. But the, as I said, the interest, the discount rate itself is not constant. But only within the valuation, the specific valuation of a, of a valuation of specific stock, okay, within within the valuation itself, uh, the when it comes to the applying, when it comes to application of interest rate, discount rate, you should apply the same interest, the same discount rate to each uh, cash flow over the, yeah, over the over the over the period of uh, over the holding period, right? But discount rate or yields, uh, the discount rate, which is purely uh, which is determined by the treasuries or yeah, at the market interest rate. Yeah. Is there changes every? It's not constant. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's why we I, I have this time. Yeah, because uh, you guys have a different interpretation and so uh, different understanding. Um, but I think you you hey the. My name is did, Anne. Did, did you get this question wrong or right? First, I got it like false, but then I rethink about the assumption, so I mark it as true. But ah, okay. Well, uh, as far as you understand my intention, then <laughs> uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I think then the assumption is very misleading. Yeah. So, because uh, why do you assume something to be constant if it changes over time, right? So it it doesn't make much sense to me. No, 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 no. As I explained to you. When you value some stock on a specific day, right? The rate you are gonna you are going to use should be should be the same, okay? When you when you uh, when you when you use when you when you use the different discount model on a specific uh, day to uh, for the valuation of the stock. The interest rate you apply to each uh, cash flow should be the same. That's true, but the interest rate itself, this country itself, changes every day. So tomorrow you're gonna apply the different this country. The day after tomorrow, another one. Okay, okay, now I, I got it now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, this is the, um, the valuation question. So I think uh, the answer is the 100, uh, seven, around 178, basically 177.9, blah, 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 right? So, uh, around the 78. So do I have to calculate this where you first uh, uh, discount this uh, year, year three, right? Year three, you have $2. And uh, the final, the terminal value in year three is going to be $2 multiplied by 1.05. Right. This is the uh, the gross rate, right? So then this one should be discounted by zero point zero six minus zero point zero five, and then 
these two cash flow should be discounted by, right? By 1.06 to uh, three times 1.06, three times. So then you, you're gonna have this 178. So then uh, if the, uh, the current, the, the trading price is uh, 150, so then it has more room, uh, more room uh, for the, 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 the increase, right? In price. So you should, you're supposed to yeah, buy this stuff. But some, some of you, you, some of you guys get this uh, uh, the first question right, then choose the sell. So uh, it was a uh, was also uh, ironic. So you some of some of you made a mistake. Okay, nine. Uh, was it so difficult? Uh, was this so difficult? Is this so difficult? I I think only only one or two. I, I don't know. Not many students get these questions right. Oh, what's going on? Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But from now on, I think uh, I'm, I'm gonna, we are gonna have a many, we're gonna have as many questions as possible during class because uh, I found that many of you guys are a little bit weak at the calculating, like the calculation. So, okay, so the power is 100 and the price of 106 and the US maturity is 20 years and the coupon is 5.4%, right? But the question, is that in the question, it is said that uh, it was uh, issued two years ago, right? So two years ago, so only 18 years left. And uh, the coupon is paid uh, quarterly, so four times a year, right? So year to, uh, year to maturity is, uh, so number of payments is uh, 18 years, uh, multiply by four times, right? This is number of uh, payments, number of uh, payments, right? So here's the maturity, when you calculate the maturity, this, uh, this is the, uh, the period, right? You see the period. This period is supposed to be minus 
and uh, multiplied two is same annual, but this is paid quarterly, so multiply four, right? And you should change it like this. And then C5 is coupon ray and uh, C2 power value. And this coupon ray should be divided by four because it paid uh, quarterly, right? Then present value 106 and future value 100. That's correct. Then you're gonna have a 1.22. But this 1.22 is a quarterly based on quarterly payment. So you should multiply by four, right? So then 4.897. Where uh, some of you guys, uh, 4.9 and 4.2, Uh, um, I guess some, some of you guys have a very uh, close numbers, uh, but um, I don't know. This needs to be very exact because uh, that's what it is, right? Um, and the coupon effective rate should be also, yeah, divided by four and multiply four times, then five point by one. So remember, many of you guys get this right, get this uh, effective rate right. Uh, do you do you get it? Kyungjun, you are there? Amina? Professor? Yeah, Ellie? Um, so I got the same number for the year two maturity. Uh -huh. Like I didn't do the same like you, like I completely changed in the chat and and then it just turned to be 0, 4.9 immediately. So is yeah. it cut it? Yeah, 4.90 is okay. Okay. Or 4.9, a9 is okay, a, a, a okay, 4.88 okay, 4.90 okay, but 4.9192, I don't know. <laughs> That's not okay, actually. But 4.90 is okay, yeah. Uh, 4.51 is okay. Can, can I show, uh, can you show me again for the formula of the EAR? Yeah, so effective rate. So effective rate is the, if the, the payment made quarterly, then you have a four times compounding, right? Oh, yeah. So you should divide the coupon, annual coupon rate by four, right? You have a four quarters and then should it be, and then this interest rate, each uh, interest payment is compounded four times. So that's why we uh, yeah, have this um, exponent of four, right? Ellie, it's okay? Yeah, I just missed it because I thought like uh, the if effective one, like the annual one should be the same with the U2 maturity, not the coupon rate. So ah. I use the YouTube maturity instead. Ah, I see. Yeah. If you use the yield maturity, then the effective uh, annual rate will change. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, uh, will change depending on the water price, the, the price of the uh, bond. Yeah, so, yeah. So effective. Effective annual rate is based on the um, yeah coupon rate. Yeah. Any objections? No. 
Okay, and then number 10 is uh, the golden growth model is flexible enough to take into account product changes in the rate of future development growth. C. Yeah, so this is <laughs> a little bit, uh, yeah, related to uh, this one, right? Um, yeah, so this uh, discount rate is constant and uh, the growth rate is supposed to be also constant. Okay. The golden growth model is one of the different discount model. Okay, um, where this time I think, uh, yeah. Professor, can I see the answer of question one again? Yeah, just a minute. Question one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I understand, I understand the bit time because it was, was not easy for you guys. Um, but um, where? Some of you guys uh, uh, you get a good score and some of you not, but um, especially number nine, I, I really, I was really on the crossroads whether, on whether I should put uh, this question on of, uh, in the in, in the midterm either because uh, well, I, I, I really thought about a lot uh, this question whether I need to, uh, yeah, give you, whether I give this question to you guys. But um, yeah, in the end I did, <laughs> uh, but uh, only very few of you guys uh, get this question right. So from now on, I think during class, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, so many questions possible. Yeah, during class. So I'm gonna give you some quiz during class. So you you gonna have a chance to practice uh, some calculation pro uh, calculation problems. Okay. So any any questions? Anything you want to say about the uh, midterm exam? Yes, the average now. So for uh, our do you know the average for our midterm now? Average is a, uh, is around uh, around five, yeah, around five. Uh, I I haven't I haven't yet calculated the average rate, but uh, in my sense, um, yeah, it was around maybe below five, yeah, oh, yeah, around plus or minus. Plus minus five. Yeah. Any other question, Professor? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a little bit confused about question three. Question three. Yes, I don't really understand the difference between A and B. Still. Just a minute. Ah. Difference so. Uh, Different C and D? Uh, no, no, question four, I'm sorry. No, question four. This one? Uh, A and B. A and B. The indenture is uh, agreement. So agreement between bond holder and the bond issuer. So indenture is a much more bigger term. So within the indenture, there's a covenant. So indenture is a contract. So um, indenture is a, a contract for bond. Okay. So uh, we, sh we, we can usually say uh, is, uh, a bond contract, but um, there's some kind of a story behind this name indenture because the, the, the bond uh, has a long history, right? So. <laughs> Um, indenture is kind of a, you know when you have a car accident, it's more uh, minute minor car accident. You kind of you have this kind of indent indenture right in the car. 
something like that. So uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a kind of a history behind this uh, name, but anyway, indenture is bond contract, and then within the bond contract, there are many many terms. The many many uh, clauses. One of the clauses is covenant. Covenant is uh, the kind of uh, requirements, conditions that uh, the bond issuers are supposed to uh, stick to uh, for the benefit of uh, for the interest of uh, bond holders. So the difference is that indenture is simply speaking contract and the covenant is the one of the term, one of the clauses within the indenture. I understand. Thank you. And I, I also have a problem, a just like question two. I mistake the, I wrote wrong. I thought the depreciation expense was five. So I made a little mistake when I was writing the figures. So my result is wrong. And I was wondering, will we have points for our process, although our result is wrong? Ah, I see. Yeah, I take a account. I take account of that. So okay, I get it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Um, if you actually, I didn't ask you guys to show the uh, process, but if you did and the process was okay, then I will definitely take account of that. Yeah. Any other, any other questions or things to you want to say about midterm? No. Professor, yeah. When when can we see our grades? Well, I'm gonna send you guys the uh, the result with uh, at the latest by tomorrow. Uh, by uh, yeah, I'm gonna send you emails yeah, individually. Then you wanna receive the result and the grade uh, in the system uh, may be finished by next week. How about the uh, how about the ranking of the students? Um, I'm gonna give you some kind of information. Professor, is it like every question has the same grade? That's like one point per question, is it? Oh, sorry, two second. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. So is it like uh, every question is gonna be one point? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you mean any different weighting to some? Yeah, question? like it depends on the difficulty. For example, if people can do the nine, like the question nine, is it like gonna be like some advantage for them or just it's gonna be rate, rating at the same as other easy question? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, because like, I feel like I spend um, kind of a lot more time for question now compared to other questions. Like, <laughs> yeah, I get it. Well, I didn't say anything about the waiting uh, to about uh, waiting on the question, each question. So, um, I don't know. Um, actually, my my initial intention was uh, I give it uh, each uh, equal waiting to each question. That was my intention, but I feel uh, yeah, understand that the, the level of difficulty is different uh, uh, for each question. So, but professor, some questions include like three or four questions in it. I mean, true false questions, for example, five, five fifths one it has four questions. Yeah, four and five. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, there is a four or four or five sections in one question. So I mean, how are we going to give one point for five, for example? Because five. Uh, yeah, zero point. Uh, uh, the it yeah. So in case of this one, if you get this uh or case of all uh, all the cases are right, then you're gonna have a, a supposed to have a one and. A, only have uh, only two, then 0 0.5, three, 0 0.75. Okay. 
only one zero point two five. Uh, sorry, I want to ask, um, uh, what is the required amount to pass? Sorry? I want to ask you about the required amount to pass. No, uh, what I'm saying is that you, you see the uh, four questions here in on, on question five, right? So if you get all the questions right, A, B, C, D, then you want to have a one. You're gonna have a full. You're gonna full. You're gonna have a full mark. But if you have only, if you get only uh, two out of four, right? Then you're gonna have zero point five. Only half. You're gonna have a half a mark. That's what I'm saying. Is there any uh, disconnect between you and me? No. Let's say I. He asked, I think he asked about what is the requirement minimum grade that if you want to pass, I guess, minimum, minimum requirement to pass this minimum test. Minimum requirement to, to pass the Yes, or, or even the class. Ah, no, no. Um, you mean F? F is the barrier, right? But I, I, but I, I there is no one there's no one who got a zero of uh, the minimum. <laughs> well, as far as you have a good attendance rate, and then it took the exam, then no one is gonna have an app, okay? Yeah, I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna give you, uh, guys, I'm not gonna give you an app to, uh, to students who attended the class and took the exam, yeah, no. Yeah. Professor, so how many exams are we going to have in total? A final. There's a, another one. The, the, the last one is going to be final. There's only one. There is only one final left, and then we, we don't have any assignments or something in between. Uh, yeah, no assignments. But um, I'm going to give you some kind of quiz during class because uh, I found that you guys are a little bit weak at calculation. So um, maybe I'm thinking Professor? about Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, oh, I will turn on my camera. You mentioned the quiz. You mean that we will be solving exam or oh, we'll be solving questions or uh, we will be solving questions for a mark? Um, well, yeah, basically, I didn't thought of, I didn't think of any assignment because I simply, uh, when it comes to grade grading, I thought of only two exams, bit time. Oh, initially three exams, two bit time and one final. But uh, because UCI is event, uh, we have only one bit time exam. Um, but so one one of the reason that we you guys had uh, you guys had some difficulty uh, uh, with this midterm exam. I didn't I didn't know uh, exactly about uh, uh, what what is the level of your understanding on the on the subject is up to uh, until I until you, until I have the until I score this uh, midterm exam. So I uh, personally. Uh, have a little bit of uh, regret uh, over regret that I didn't give you guys the assignments before the exam to, to see where you guys are. Um, so now, the one, the biggest thing I found from this big term exam is that you guys are a little bit weak at the calculation, uh, the basic calculation. So, as I said, uh, uh, what really matter is the understanding of a concept. So, yeah, sure. The, in the midterm exam, I focused on on, uh, on understanding of the concept rather than calculation. But there's only one or two calculations uh, problems. But only some of you guys get these questions right. So I was a little bit surprised. So um, I thought of. Uh, Giving you guys, yeah. So Ellie, um, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of any 
any assignment uh, because some of you guys may fear uh, if, if, if they they have a very uh, a little bit poor mark of uh, poor scores in the middle term, they may want to they may want to uh, make up right so they may want a chance to make up the, for the poor score from the in midterm exam or maybe maybe they could be uh, uh, upon where in the final so uh, I'm thinking of some uh, some ways uh, uh, for you guys to make up for the uh, binary uh, uh, midterm if you did a, a little bit poor job. Yeah. Professor, uh -huh. wouldn't it be better if we just have uh, two or three questions during the class and you give some time for us to solve it and then we solve it together and check whether we did it right or wrong. It will that's, be that's, a great practice for us. That's what I'm going to do today. That's what I intended today. If you look at the slide, there are some uh, several questions. A like quiz one, quiz two, quiz three, four, five. So this is, uh, if you look today, I thought of uh, <laughs> giving you some quizzes, uh, small quizzes, uh, but so, I, I, I wanted to give you some, uh, I intended to give you some time to start with these uh, questions during the class, but yeah, th this is what I'm going to do uh, after, uh, from now on, uh, because uh, uh, then I think it, it will help, um, it will help to communicate uh, between you guys, right? And more, yeah, some of you guys suggested more, we need more dynamics, right? I definitely agree. So I think it will help uh, yeah, put some dynamics on this class and uh, help, uh, under, help uh, improve your understanding. This, uh, some of the, yeah, this, this subject. So Professor, yeah, 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 I agree. Yes, early. For the quiz during the classes, like how are we going to submit it? Are we going to write it in the bus chat for you or just like send it through your email or what? As when it comes to the um, grading, uh, I think I'm, I'm thinking of based on, based on your practice uh, uh, during class, Ellie, I, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm thinking of giving you guys some um, separate assignment that is that is going to be that is going to be included in your uh, binary score. So quiz is just a kind of a practice, not included in your grade. But um, I'm thinking of one or two assignment before binary. Okay, so then then yeah. Then I will put all the uh, the result, uh, the, the put a uh, final midterm uh, results and the some uh, and the quality of uh, assignment into the uh, the final score. Yeah. So, Professor. Yes. Uh, can you remind, please, what topics did we cover after the topics for midterm exam? I remember capital budgeting, and did we cover something more? Because uh, I completely lost after the preparation, so I don't remember what we were talking about before the midterm. Okay, just a minute. So uh, we are around. We are at. We are here. Risk and return, right? And then we uh, we did a capital budgeting. So risk and return, long term financing, and short term finance management, and. Uh, 
if possible, international aspect of financial management. So I tried to cover all of the parts of this textbook. We are now at risk and return, part six. So we fully uh, studied capital budgeting and did we st start risk and return or no, I don't remember, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we will, uh, we will uh, go back to return and risk. So today is risk and return uh, topic too. So I'm gonna follow on on the uh, previous lecture. So, okay. So if you guys find we the uh, the answers to the uh, final and the midterm exam, uh, I'm gonna take account of your process and um, yeah, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm thinking of giving you some assignments for so that you guys, some of you guys who did it, some poor marks on the midterm exam may have chance to make up. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, anything else? No? Okay, so then let's move on to uh, the risk of return, okay? Return, so in the previously, uh, in previously we talked about the geometric uh, average return, okay? So, uh, I think a geometry of every return and uh, we, in the previous lecture, we did this variance and standard deviation and the normal distribution, right? Uh, but it was very quick. So I, I don't think you guys had enough time to um, digest this, the concept of this. Uh, of this. First of all, geometric average return. Geometric average return is different from uh, um, arithmetic arithmetic uh, average return. So why do we uh, have to learn? Why do we have to uh, have, why, why do we have to understand the geometric average return? Because, uh, <clears throat> you know what, we, we are talking about uh, financing. Financing is uh, uh, corporate financing. Corporate financing is, uh, basically uh, directly related to investment. Why? Because uh, corporate financing is the basically um, talking about equity financing or uh, debt financing, right? So the shareholders and the creditors, they are investing. They are making investment in the company through the, uh, through, through the purchase of shares or bonds, right? That's why uh, the the, in, uh, the investment uh, in, in the, the we have to calculate the return in terms of uh, investment, right? So in the investment, the return when you calculate return, you should use geometric average rather than arithmetic average. Arithmetic average is like, uh, as you know, if you have uh, several numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five. You just add these numbers and then divide by four, right? So then you have every uh, arithmetic uh, average. The assumption of arithmetic, arithmetic um, average is that these numbers, one, two, three, four, these numbers are independent, okay? This one does not affect two, these two does not affect three or one or four. So these, all these numbers are independent. They do not affect each other. But in the geometric average, they basically, the, the basic assumption is that this, the one, two is each period, right? This is each period, the period one, period two, period three, three, three and period T. The one period return affecting the following period. 
and period two return affecting period three, right? Let's assume that you have, uh, you make an investment into stock, right? You initially you have $100. So you purchase a Tesla stock, stock Tesla. And then you purchase the Tesla at one hundred dollars, right? Then day one, stock value, stock price has increased to one hundred one hundred one. And day two, it may go down ninety eight, right? So let's say you um, you purchase a Tesla stock and day one you per, uh, you sell this Tesla stock at one hundred one. Then you have one dollar gain, right? And then. Assume that you invest this 101 in the same stock, right? Then you then day two you have 98. So you have a reduced value of this stock. So the thing is that day one, your return is. 100, 101 minus 100, right? This is your return. And this return plus one plus this return is going to be your principal amount, right? In the next investment, period two, period one, period two day two. And depending on what the return is, you're going to have uh, this result. You, you, your return should be based on uh, this calculation. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> your principal changes. OK, this one is principal amount. How can I easily explain to you guys? Okay, let me see. So in the geometric return, each period, the, the, the return of each period is supposed to affect the next the, the following period, right? So you made an investment uh, in stock, and uh, at some point it was 100, the other time it was 110, the other time 98, the other time 9102. Your principal, if you keep, re keep, you keep reinvesting your, uh, your, your money, right? So then the previous amount, uh, is going to affect the return in the next period. So period one, this is period one, period two, period three, right? So period one, two, three, you initially have $101 and the period two, the value of the price of value 98. So then the return is 101 minus 101 minus 98. This is the, the return from P1, P2, right? And the P2, P3, you have $98, 98. So you basically 98, I'm sorry. This should not be like this. 98 minus 100 and 102 minus 98. So this is the return during P2 and P3, right? 
So your previous previous the, this previous price, right? Is affecting the return the next period because this amount is going to be in the denominator in the calculation return. So that's why we use uh, multiplication, not plus. Plus, when you add each numbers, I mean, this plus means that each numbers are independent. They are not related, not related. But if you use this multiplication, then this return is supposed to affect yeah, the next one. This one also back to the next one. As you can see, we can clearly see how this previous re, previous uh, previous stock price affect the return, the calculation return in the next period, because the as you can see. Nine in period two period three ninety eight dollars becomes in the becomes the denominator, and the period three period four this period three uh, the stock price becomes denominator right and then what let's say it's period four stock price by one hundred five one hundred five minus one hundred so this is going to be return over one period from period three to to period of four. So if you multiply like this, then this is gonna be total return, okay? Including the uh, principal amount. So the, the reason we um, uh, minus one is that you deducted principal amount. So you, if you deduct minus one, if you deduct one, then you have only rate of return, okay? You guys understand? Are you guys following me? Yes, professor. Okay. It's like, it's, this is very similar to the, okay. Let's say this one is X, right? X T minus one Y, right? Then Y plus one T, right? Is X. So if you have this uh, average return and multiply t, right? But uh, every return plus uh, one, one is principal, uh, the, your initial investment fund amount, and t, then you're gonna have uh, t times the number of period, the, the investment period, then you're gonna have x amount. Your total amount uh, from the investment is gonna be x. Okay, this is like uh, it to maturity. It to maturity is the you have a series of uh, cash flows, right? And uh, you discount uh, uh, you have a series of the cash flows, and uh, you have a current price, right? But this discount the this is count rate for each period is supposed to be different. But since the yield maturity, the average return, if you uh, use the average return, then the same rate will be used to discount each cash flows. Then you have the current price. So yield maturity is kind of a average uh, rate, average interest rate over the long period of time, over the 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 over the 
of the holding period, okay, of the uh, age maturity is the of the period up to the maturity of the bond, right? When the interest and discount rate over the period uh, is different and changing, but only based on the on the specific day, uh, if you apply the uh, the interest rate over over different period, then you are supposed to have some specific amount of price of the bond, right? But uh, it maturity is. Uh, uh, you just want to have one single rate that uh, that that makes the the present value of the cash flows equal to the price of the bond, right? Likewise, uh, we have uh, a different rate of return for each period, but we, you you want to know what is the average return for this period for t this period t, right? So that is the geometric return. And why do we have uh, this multiplication? Because uh, each rate of return is supposed to affect the rate of return in the next period, right? Because in the investment, uh, each uh, return is not separate from the next uh, uh, rate of return because you keep the yeah i mean if you lose one money one at a specific period then you have less amount of uh, uh, money to invest reinvest right so then that is supposed to affect the result of in result of investment the next period that's why we use uh, this term metric average return rather than arithmetic return. Arithmetic return is just simply add the each return and divide by the number of period. But that's not very accurate. Okay. This is how, let's say, in period one, uh, you have 11.14 percentage return and blah, 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 right? And then this return is, uh, it, this return is based on the, uh, the result of this return. And this return is based on the result of this return, right? Let's say one, you have a 100, then 111.14, right? In period one. And in period two, this amount will be reinvested, right? So then 11.14 uh, multiplied by 1.0.3713 is going to be amount in period two. In period two. Right, so keep going like this. And then this is going to be five period, right? And then if you, and then if you, if you minus one, if you did minus, if you did one, then you want to have this one. This is multiplication. Okay. Why do we add one? Because this is the uh, initial initial amount, but this initial amount is change every period, right? Initial amount 100, and initial amount to, uh, in period two is this one, right? Period three, initial amount of this one. But anyway, uh, if you want to get return, you should deduct minus one initial investment, okay? 
Any question? Um, okay, uh, we don't have time. Okay, so um, I, I'm gonna send you guys the email and uh, I'll send you guys a result by email by tomorrow. And uh, if you have any objections, please send me email. If there may be some mistakes with scoring, so if there are any mistakes, please let me know by email. Okay, so any other questions? No? So we are gonna start uh, from here in the next lecture this uh, Thursday. Okay, so see you this Thursday. Uh, have a, a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye.